Good evening, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project and Magnetic Reversal News. Don't forget Shinrin Yoku. And we're bringing you a Grand Solar Minimum update Tuesday, January 12th, after midnight, 2021. The models are in. And with the stratospheric warming event, it's showing heavy snow across the top tier, the, it, the top 48. That's your fate. The big news, that is the polar vortex about to split in two. But what does that actually mean? Well, it means a blob of warm air high in the atmosphere has pushed the polar vortex off its axis over the past week. In the coming days, it's likely to split into pieces with possible ripple effects on weather across the northern hemisphere. But don't start st stopping up on blizzards yet. Another distorted vortex has been linked to the blizzards and cold snaps before. Atmospheric scientists say that it's too soon to know what the is going on. Keep calm. Yes, it's clueless time. Hello. Polar vortex with frigid temperatures nears the U.S. What to know? The coming days, America is being warned to brace themselves for a period of extreme cold brought on by this year's polar vortex. Bloomberg Green reported. Now, there are global warming alarmists at Bloomberg Green, but what it means is negative temperatures in lots of the upper Midwest, maybe the Northeast. The vortex, which to hit the U.S. in 2019, led to 21 deaths, will likely cause temperatures across the country to plummet and bring the potential for snowstorms, according to USA Schmidt or Bidet, however you want to think about it. Atmospheric river brings flooding landslides to Washington and Oregon. Now, the atmospheric river may bring heavy rain and flooding to the northern Pacific. And that's what we're looking at. The rainfall and melting snow and higher elevations could trigger flooding and landslides. It's been one of the wettest starts to January on record for some of the Pacific Northwest locations. And they have snow standing in areas that hasn't been seen for over a decade. It's insane. Snow on the palm trees gets us every time. The biggest snow in more than three years in Jackson, Mississippi, is putting snow right on those palms. And it's a glorious sight. Yes, indeed. Shut up, Al. Get in your hole. He's, he's worried. Now, Texas, the nexus of the Schmexis, has received some of the most incredible snowfall in recent times. Let's take a look. Yeah. <laughs> Now, these kids are having a ball in Texas because Al Gore told them that they would never see snow. Ho, ho, ho. And certainly this is a sight for sore eyes for many people, especially these children who may have never seen snow in their entire lifetime. Yeah. Bring it on. This is Texas, by the way. Three, two, one. Oh, snow angel time. Make it snow. Oh, and boom. There you go. We love it when a plan comes together. Give him a thumbs up here. I don't even know where this is coming from. WFAA. Subscribe to the channel just because I'll link it to you. Who knew? We did. Yeah, we, we've been reporting on snow in Texas for quite some time now.
is this January eight inches of snow in Louisiana while none is forecast new for New England in the coming weeks? Well, that's a little disingenuous. But yes, snow in Louisiana, we've been reporting on up to 10 days ago and no one listened. In fact, people in Louisiana were like, okay, buddy. But more than 112,000 customers remain without power across Texas and Louisiana on Monday afternoon as a powerful snowstorm continued to move south. Yes, and it's still moving there. Moving and moving. Areas of east and northeast Texas, including La Mesa, which received nine inches of snow, saw poor visibility due to fog, according to tweets from the National Weather Service Midland. Hello. The National Weather Service in Boston, well, they pointed out that they're being left out. Parts of Louisiana received eight inches of snow, while no snow is predicted for New England over the next weekend. Ooh, who lost? You did. And that's a boom. Where are we? Let's just let this catch up. Return of wintry conditions on the horizon across the Midwest. Apparently the video won't play. So far, this winter season can be described as lackluster for most of the major Midwestern cities. However, that's going to change quickly, like a schmickly. Lake effect snow for the Buffalo Metro and North Towns on Tuesday. That's your lose day. And there's more, but it's slowly parsing up here. Multiple rounds of snow to hit Colorado in the upcoming days. It's insazed. Atmospheric river impacting the Northwest. We started on that. An atmospheric river event will impact the western portions of the Pacific Northwest over the next couple of days, bringing heavy and persistent rain to the heavy mountain snow. Ho, ho, ho. Flooding, flash flooding, landslides, and debris flows are possible. A high wind event will spread across the northern Rockies into the northern plains through Thursday. So here we have some special colors in the brown. We don't even know what that means. <laughs> high wind watch. Hello. It used to be red. They like to switch it up. Take a look at Top Nuts Boyhood Home already in the winter storm watch. Hello. That is Michigan, isn't it? And here you see the flooding events and watches on the Pacific Northwest, Washington State, Oregon. Inland, there's a little bit of snow watches and warnings up to the north. They're about to get pummeled. Let's check the models. And they are not schmodels. They are absolutely pummeling snow events. Bring it back. And we'll pause it. Yes, we can do that. So here is your uh, Tuesday through your Wednesday. Heavy snow into Idaho, northern Idaho especially, all of Washington State uh, in the mountainous regions especially. We're talking one to four feet of snow in many regions. And this is just going to add insult to injury as it moves down south. So the storm is only going to get as far south as central Colorado and the Rockies and then just move east. Here you can see Wisconsin's the big picker up of the heavy totals. Michigan's going to get some. And snow all the way down through the Tennessee Valley in the mountains from, yes, take a look, from northern Georgia all the way up through Pennsylvania. The spine through the weekend. It's going to be Monday, Tuesday. That's their lose day in this region. Eastern Appalachians, hello. And it's a ho, ho, ho. And then by the end of the month, sudden stratospheric warming is going to bring snowy potential all the way down here. Yeah, to 33 degrees north. Everything north of there will be covered in snow. Ho, ho, ho. Including North Kakalaki, Virginia, all of West Virginia buried in the deep, all of PA extending all the way to the Jersey Shore, if you believe the models. Al Gore is a whore. Yes, and here we are in Europe. There is no exception to the rule. In fact, it is unruly. If these totals come true, record snow totals throughout Europe, the UK, we're talking three to four feet, and the eastern shores in the south. Hello, and Scotland. You haven't seen snow like this since I don't know when. We're going to check the models. Greta's boyhood home also buried on and on. Even Denmark picking up on the pink. That's 10 to 12 centimeters in Denmark. Hello, Heinrich Bittenhus. Spain is still digging itself out from its worst snowstorm in five decades. There it is, days later when it's warming up. Spain is still digging itself out from the biggest snowstorm to hit the Mediterranean in 50 years, slammed the capital Madrid. 
and surrounding regions over the weekend, disrupting transit and efforts to distribute the coronavirus vaccine. Well, thank goodness, at least some people will live. Winter's tail UK weather. UK to see blizzards and heavy snow next week with temperatures down to 10C after the beast from the east returns. Well, always salacious over there in the UK reporting. But we agree. Iceland geology strong earthquake swarm we reported on three days ago has upticked as of yesterday. Yes, January 10th. An earthquake with magnitude of 4.1. This earthquake was felt as far away as Reykjanef. A swarm of small earthquakes is currently ongoing in this area. The earthquake activity is in the volcano, the Reykjanes volcano here. And over 100 earthquakes have happened in this area for the last 48 hours. Most of them are small, less than magnitude 1. However, there is no sign that magma has started to find a way to the surface. But they know it's moving underground. And that's why the warning was put out. So close eye. Hello. On Iceland. Keep it close. It's nice to have a uh, nice reprieve from the daily grind of the insanity going on on planet Earth. So let's get to it. If, well, if they'll let us get to it. I have no idea what's coming up, but it won't even parse. There it is. And that's a boom. Strong earthquake hits lake in northern Mongolia. I'm, so, I'm sure of a lot. This is like 11 hours ago. A strong 6-7 magnitude earthquake has struck a lake along the Russian-Mongolian border. Very few people live here. I'm sure lives were lost. Very little reporting in this region. Northern Mongolia, for sake. But a significant earthquake nonetheless, and thankfully in a, a, a quite uninhabited zone. And that's not all we have to talk about. There is that quake uh, we just reported on initially followed by dozens or hundreds, even thousands of aftershocks in Mongolia. The most recent quake popping off here in Mexico of no significance, mid-ocean ridges popping. Here's a 5.4 in uh, the, tri the triple point junction there. And so we have a moderate uptick of quakes worldwide, probably a 5% uptick. Nothing significant. Worldwide Volcano News Update. Kluchiskal. To 20,000, Ducono, Reventador, Sangay, Sabancaya, 25,000 foot at Sangay, 26 at Sabancaya, Fuego at 15,000, and on and on. Kilo Chivalouche, yes, really nice product here at 19,000. And so, normal activity worldwide, I'm not even going to go down the list. I'm pretty sure nothing spectacular has happened in the last 24. But we do have a Kilauea update, so let's soak it in and, and just. Take a look and see what they have to say. What was that? Maybe that was my tissues. Who knows? Kilauea continues to erupt at the summit caldera, and the Hawaii Island volcano remains at an alert level of watch. Vents are still active on the northwest side of the crater, feeding into a lava lake which continues to slowly deepen. The lake was most recently measured at 643 feet deep, the Holy U.S. Geological macaroni. Survey Hawaiian Volcano Observatory noted in its Monday update that the eastern half of the lava lake appears stagnant. It also measured a few yards shallower than the western half, and last night it appeared to have subsided below its perch rims. Scientists recently recorded this new video shown here at an accelerated playback, documenting the crustal foundering and resurfacing at the summit. They say this foundering process has become Boom common time. in the eastern portion of the lava lake. HVO says that all smaller islands of solidified lava that were floating around in the lake were stationary over the past day, as if frozen in the stagnation. This HVO video shows activity at the western fissure on January 8th. The lava stream appeared weaker than it did several days before. However, on Sunday afternoon, the vents started to exhibit stronger output. On Monday morning, summit tilt meters were recording inflationary tilt, and seismicity remained elevated but stable. Researchers set up temporary seismic instruments around the summit area to collect data that will help them learn more about how magma travels in the shallow system beneath the volcano. So far, there is no indication that additional magma is currently moving into either of Kilauea's rift zones. Although the majority of the information on the volcanic activity is coming to us from the U.S. geological... So good news, there is no activity in the rift zone. All the activity has been uh, centered in this major caldera here up at Kilauea and that's good news 
there is inflation on the northern rim here, which means more magma is going to be pumping in here, and this is going to be an ongoing event for weeks, if not months to come. So that's the update. That's my take on it. And that's the facts from a geologist right before your very lives. Here we are at Space Weather, and we can see here from telemetry that sometime around uh, 18, almost 24 hours ago, there was an uptick, instantaneous, on temperature, speed, plasma speed, and plasma density. This is the coronal whole stream coupling. If not, it would be a CME that happened instantaneous. It took a three to six hours for the phi angle to start shifting, and that's when we got the first uh, major uh, earthquake. The 6.8 kicking off in Mongolia happened right about this time here, where the major uptick in the phi angle shifted beyond 180. And then another uh, earthquake that we showed happened right here at the next phi angle shift. So space weather has everything to do with everything we talk about. And here we can see estimated planetary K index got up to KP4 for 3, 6, 9, 12, 15 hours. Hours of powers at geomagnetic instability dropping down to KP3 now. And all is quiet on the Western Front. Worldwide Volcano News Update. Nothing special. We've already reported on it. And we'll get over it. <laughs> I don't know how we looped around there. It was a big, big loop. But apparently we have this all up twice. Now, a new paper coming out, 8th of October, 2020. Low Antarctic continental climate sensitivity due to high ice sheet orography. Now, let me just reiterate that in layman's terms. There is no warming in the Antarctic since we begin taking samples. Yes, in fact, the Antarctic continent has not warmed in the last seven decades, despite monotonic increase in atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases. That means they can kiss your asses. There is no evidence in Antarctica that human-caused, quote-unquote, CO2 output has anything to do with climatology. And thank God that Han Sai Sing and Lorenzo Polvani have the cojones to publish in the Climate and As Atmospheric Sciences uh, periodical that there is no global warming. Now, all their funding may be gone, but in this paper, they investigate whether the high orography of the Antarctic ice sheet has helped delay warming. Do you see how they get their funding? They said there is no warming over 70 years, but may maybe it's delayed. So please give us some more funding. <laughs> These schmucks. Well, that's how they have to do their science now. They're racing for the funding. And we're racing for the bandwidth because nothing is loading, folks. Bear with us. It's coming. And we're not bumming. We're just going to click on some of these so we can maybe parse them up. And that goes all the way to the boom, which is important because the entire last half of the show is based on facts. Now, a San Francisco millennial was fit and healthy before he got COVID-19. Now he's disabled and quote unquote, a long hauler. I'm sure you've seen this on uh, the lamestream reports that there are people that get COVID-19 and they never regain their sense of smell and taste. And you can read the whole story about this pathetic individual, whatever his name is. I don't even know if they give it yet. No, it doesn't. But here's what you're going to glean from this. Take a look at this schmuck right here. He claims that he can't go to work. He can't do anything. He's a millennial. He's feeling weak and perturbed. And according to the article, what would you think if you read this headline? that he got COVID-19 and he's now recovering from it, correct? That's what I thought. And then I actually read the article. He's only 31, a year ago. McCone bicycled 10 miles round trip to a South Market marketing job at the San Francisco Parks Alliance. 
So he's completely physically fit. I mean, he's completely awesome. He played tennis, soccer, volleyball, and all the dumb shit that everyone plays. He managed the local indie pop band French Cassettes, for goodness sake. And his girlfriend socialized a lot. They drank, smoked pot. Maybe they ate pills and smoked a little meth. But it doesn't matter. They dined out. They hit bars. They did some hiking. And they talked about getting married. And then March 16 hit. And McCone got very sick. He developed chest pain, extreme fatigue. He couldn't take a deep breath. He was listening to the propaganda on TV. His lips turned blue. Who knew? He could barely get out of bed. There were definitely nights where I was scared to go to sleep, he recalled. Then he got tested. Yeah. And he didn't have COVID-19. He traveled to countries where the virus was prevalent or had come in close contact with someone who had tested positive for the virus. But still, by the time he got tested, it was negative. And then they did an antibody test three months later, and it was negative. And based on those two tests, this schmuck never had COVID-19, based on the tests. But the doctor that he's seeing said all the symptoms are, are showing that you have COVID-19. They didn't test for anything else. And this poor schmuck, who is completely complacent with the current paradigm in our uh, corporatocracy hospitalization syndrome, they say he has COVID-19. He's never tested positive. They gave him a future test of antibodies, which shows that he never even had COVID-19. And the doctor says that today it's because of COVID-19. That's where we're at. Completely no science. Scientists find 16 ultra black fish species that absorb 99.9% .9 of light. Now you have to go down a few miles to check, the, check out these fish, but they are totally awesome. Ultra black skin seems to be an evolutionary adaptation that helps fish camouflage themselves in the deep seas, which ultimately is a cloak that makes them invisible. It's amazing. And then they can eat all the bioluminescent organisms at that depth. Look at the teeth on this. Oh, just amazing what happens down there. And we still don't know what's going on in our own oceans. But COVID-19 is killing millions. New DNA evidence rewrites Caribbean history. Yeah, because it was erased. And if you read this article, you can see how sometime in the past, maybe about 2,000 years ago, all the information was burned. This is a sign of things to come because things are being burned in plain sight right now while you listen to this podcast including the presidency of our current president. Two new studies shed light on who first inhabited the islands. Yes, they were the Mayans and the Incas who replaced them and how few people live there. Yeah, they were the same people that lived in North America, which we call the Hopi, and they're all the same people. So when will academia stop being sheeple? Anyone's guess, ringtail cat caught in Colorado. One of the rarest animals, a marsupial caught in Colorado. Take a look. There's the picture. I can't even make it up I'm telling you facts. Citing censorship concerns, North Idaho internet providers block Facebook and Twitter. Now, these, <laughs> these providers are heroes. Now, what they're doing is if anyone has Wi-Fi in this region and they're trying to access face, face, Facebook or the twatter, they're going to get the squatter, the squatter man, because they've blocked them. Just like they blocked us, they blocked them. And kudos to them. Oldest North American rock art may be 14,800 years ago. Now, this rock art just as long as a decade ago, was dated at 7,800 years ago, even 6,000. And now we've more than doubled it. Yeah. These are glimmers of hope 
in actual science coming to the forefront. And this is in Nevada. So as the lake in Nevada drained during the Younger Dryas event, ancient man carved some of the most spectacular art and glyphs on these stones. While they watched the most amazing plasma streaming through the uh, ionosphere and up into the into space. I mean, it could have been an amazing time. But we'll get to that in a future podcast. The Juno spacecraft discovers FM radio signals coming from Jupiter's moon. Yeah, no thanks. Now, we've long postulated that Jupiter's moons are an excellent place for life. But we never thought about what FM radio signal they were listening to. Was it WKRP in Cincinnati or 94.1 Hard Rock in Philly? Who knows? But we may get to the bottom of that in times to come. Researchers uncovered a 5,000-year-old crystal dagger buried in Spain. It's insane. Let me just tap out that J-bag. Now, researchers uncovered a 5,000-year-old crystal dagger buried in Spain. This was reported last year during the pandemic, so not a lot of people heard about it. But they have discovered many tools left behind by a prehistoric civilization. Most of these are made of stone, but in Spain, the researchers have found incredible weapons made of pure rock crystal, silicon dioxide, SiO2, yo. That's called quartz. And it's almost impossible to cleave, haft, and shape into, yes, a projectile point. It's almost impossible. I've tried it. Flint napping is possible. Quartz crystal napping, impossible. That's why many people that have studied the Clovis that have made similar designs 13,000 plus years ago have no idea how they created this technology. And this technology is no different. Take a look. There is no one on earth that can replicate this type of projectile point, period. Even if you have a CNC machine, you cannot make this type of point, period. So what say you? Archaeologists studying the rock claim that it is commonly found in the late prehistoric Iberian sites, but it is rarely studied in depth. Why? Because they have no explanation for it. This is what they call projectile points. These were supposedly on the tips of arrows. I've never seen a projectile point this pointy, and this, I mean, this is not what they're explaining. They are completely clueless as to what this means. And their explanation is even more ridiculous. These were only used in burials. So back five, you know, five, 7,000 years ago during hunter-gatherer times, the most amazing technological feats were not used for hunting. They were used for burials. That makes sense. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Now, pyramids discovered underwater off the coast of Cuba are definitely from a civilization that existed over 14,000 years ago. And no one is reporting on this. I'm just going to bring it back to the forefront. And so I'm going to get some amazing technology. Not here, but I have to go up the road a piece, maybe 30, 50 miles to, to access it. And we're going to do some deep dives into the Cuban pyramids in a podcast coming soon. That shit is amazing, by the way. The world's oldest story. Astronomers say global myths about the seven sisters. This is the Pleiades reach back 100,000 years. And you know why? Because 100,000 years ago, there weren't nine stars. There were only seven. And now we have a much different setup. And people are wondering, how come the ancients weren't able to see the, the nine stars we see in the Pleiades with the naked eye? Because if you go back 100,000 years, there would only be seven there. Food for thought. A lot of food. A genetic history of the pre-contact Caribbean. Humans settled the Caribbean 6,000 years ago, and ceramic used an intensified 
architectural, agricultural marks a shift from the archaic to the ceramic. Let me just poo-poo the whole abstract and tell you what happened here in the Caribbean. The Caribbean islands were populated by the South Americans. We're talking the Aztecs and the Mayans. And, and this group, since 12,000 years ago, remained there. And all the genetics are the same. And the stories that, that talk about the Caribbean are talking about uh, white people moving there. Now, unfortunately, white people have only come into the paradigm in recent history. And there were other whites that were not Europeans, including the Vikings. They, they came here thousands of years earlier including Veracocha, who's from Atlantis, which has nothing to do with the Vikings or the European whites. They were the Atlantean whites, which we're all descended from, if, if we're white. So it's not a racial thing. It's an anthropological, historical thing. And we're not racists. We're scientists. So you can go suck it. Hope you got something out of the video. Times are changing. Archaeologists and scientists are either swelling or swooning. And that means they're either falling or increasing. And I think that none of this matters because the next five years is going to be the end of the empire. If you're not investing in proper prior planning to prevent piss poor performance, you're investing in death and complacency. You'll take the chip, you'll take the mark, you'll take that global income, and that's what we do not want you to do. Do not be part of the machine. The Borg is eminent. It's imminent. It's coming. You can either choose to be part of the Borg or choose to be part of the resistance. We're resistant. Join us. And that's a fucking boom to the resistance. Click on one of the boxes illuminating around you to gain more knowledge. Thanks to all our one-time donors, our Patreons. We love you. Without you, None of this is possible. And that is a boom.